Hello and welcome again to my Physical Science Online Lab video series. In today's video I want to discuss the uh, simple pendulum, I'll do a walkthrough of the simple pendulum lab in other words. So a simple pendulum basically consists of a light virtually massless string with some small mass, small uh, mass lengthwise attached to the end of it. So this is called the pendulum bob and this whole thing is the pendulum. So what you're going to need to do this experiment is a string of some sort. I actually am using some simple fishing line um, so it needs to be sturdy enough that it can hold um, let's say up to a couple kilograms worth of mass at the end of it you'll need a protractor because you're going to want to know what angle you're pulling this pendulum back at you need of course your mass uh, to attach to the pendulum I'm just using a simple uh, mass set and you know you can be creative if you're doing this at home use uh, sinkers or rocks or a uh, small cup that you add water or sand or what have you to as long as you know how much mass is on the end of it and then last but not least you're going to want something to measure the actual length of the pendulum with um, also I guess I should add something to time the pendulum motion with so I'm using a simple stopwatch for that so there's basically three parameters that you have control of in this pendulum. One is how much mass you have at the end of this uh, on the bob. So here I have 100 grams attached. I can add another 100 grams and now there's 200 grams attached, etc. You can change the initial angle that you pull the pendulum back by. So you measure that by sticking the little uh, uh, protractor up at the top of the pendulum at the anchor point and then there's a little crosshair usually on these protractors or a little hole so you want the string to line up vertically with that crosshair going through that hole and at the initial angle uh, if you don't pull on it, it should be 90 degrees uh, so then you can pull to the side by some number so I've pulled it to where it's reading 80 degrees that's a 10 degree initial displacement so you can change how much you pull it back by although I would say you need to not exceed 15 or at the very utmo uh, very most 20 degrees and then last but not least you can also change the length of the pendulum I can do that by simply unlooping it from the little support structure or relooping it around the support structure. And so you'll want to measure what length of pendulum you're using. Usually you measure from the suspension point to the center of mass for all the masses that are attached. So this one's actually about uh, 45 centimeters long. So there's, you're going to change each of these three things, length, pole angle, and mass, and you've got to change them independently of one another. That means that I've got 200 grams here and I've got a length of 45 centimeters. So I place the, the pole angle initially at, let's say, 2 degrees, and then I release it then I figure out what the period is for that. Then I move it to four degrees and I release it and I figure out the period for that and so on. Then when I have finished with all those I then switch uh, how much mass I'm using but I now choose a specific angle to pull back from, maybe 10 degrees. And then I switch the mass again. Maybe I add a little more mass and I go back to pulling by 10 degrees and release and then I add a little more mass and I pull by 10 degrees and release and so on. Then I go back to my initial mass 200 grams I go back to that uh, uh, 
10 degree initial pull angle and I changed only the length. So for each of these independent uh, parameters, you're gonna wanna get somewhere between eight and 12 data points in which you have changed that parameter. So if I am doing mass, then I need to have eight to 12 data points in which I've changed only the mass. If you're doing the pull angle, 8 to 12 data points in which the only thing that's changed is the initial pull angle, the initial displacement. And if I'm doing length, 8 to 10 uh, uh, data points in which the only thing that has changed is the length. So if you decide to do 10 each, that means you're going to ultimately have 30 data points. Um, you will end up making a uh, data table that looks something like this guy right here. So this is the data table that I made for initial displacement versus period. You'll notice that there's actually a third column in here for time. Um, so what's the difference between this column and this column? Um, so I've done this with uh, 100 grams attached to the uh, uh, pendulum. So that's in a configuration like this, uh, in which I just have the hanger, and a 45 centimeter pendulum length. So what I did to actually make this data table is I went through at each of these initial displacements, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc. And I timed over several complete oscillations. So what's a complete oscillation? If I pull back and release, there's one oscillation. I went back, or I went, went out, and it came back to my hand, that's one whole oscillation. One oscillation, two oscillations, three oscillations, four oscillations, etc. Now, each of those oscillations may only take a second or so to uh, complete. So the period of oscillation is, say, a second. If that's true, then if I'm just trying to time one oscillation and my reaction time is 0.2 seconds, I've got 0.2 seconds when I first release this thing and another 0.2 seconds when I stop the timer. So plus or minus 0.4 seconds if you add both ends together. That's a 40% margin of error. One way to get around this is that each oscillation should actually have the same duration. So you take your stopwatch, you pull back by whatever displacement you're going to use, say 10 degrees. So I'll go ahead and pull it to 10 degrees. There's 90, so there's 10, and I release it. And you start your stopwatch. You actually can wait a few swings if you're doing this alone. If you have a, a lab partner, then they can maybe be in charge of timing it while you do the uh, pulling and releasing and measuring of the angle. So you're going to start the timer at the beginning of an oscillation. Two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So there were ten oscillations there. I got a time of 13.338 seconds. So ten oscillations took me 13.338 seconds. You could even say plus or minus 0.4 seconds for my reaction here and, and my reaction at the end. So the beginning and the end. Well, 0.4 seconds is not such a big fraction of 13.3 seconds. It is, in fact, uh, you know, a couple percent, two, three percent. Much better than that 40 percent that goes with a one second oscillation, or as it turns out, about a 1.3 second oscillation. So to find the period, you take this time and you divide by the number of oscillations you've timed for. Um, so that ends up giving you a chart like this. So 
10 degrees, uh, 13 point, last time I did it was 3212, this time it was 13.338 seconds. Take that, divide it by the number of oscillations, and you've got the period. So you'll make one data table that looks something like this. It doesn't have to be 100 grams or 45 centimeters. It's just one particular mass, one particular length. You choose the mass, you choose the length. Then you'll make another one in which you have one particular pole angle. I use 10 degrees because it was convenient. One particular length, and you're varying the masses here. Get the times, get the periods. Then you'll make a third data table, one particular mass, one particular pole angle, and you vary the lengths. And you get some times, you get some periods. And then you'll make a set of graphs, one for each of these three data tables. And what you want to do is figure out which of these uh, parameters actually affects periods. So if your graph makes a horizontal line, then it means that the the uh, period is probably independent of the parameter you're graphing against. So you'll have a graph that is, for example, period on the y-axis versus initial pole angle on the x-axis. You'll have period on the y-axis versus uh, mass on the x-axis. You'll have period on the y-axis versus length on the x-axis. So some of these may give you a horizontal line. Others should give you either a non-horizontal line, meaning a diagonal line, or a curve of some sort. So the next step is that the ones that give you curves, you should square an appropriate axis, replot it, make a line of it, and then once you've done that, find slopes of the line, and that pretty much finishes the lab out. So thanks for watching, and I hope this video helps you while you attempt this lab and good luck uh, doing these labs at home. Bye.